Um, so my name is Jenny. I'm the gallery manager at Gallagher and Turner. This is Claire. Hi. Um, so just to let you all know that this is this meeting will be recorded. Um, and yeah, if you could all keep your mute, microphones muted for now. And I will just give a quick introduction to Gallagher and Turner to start us off. So Gallagher and Turner is a modern and contemporary art gallery and specialist picture framer in Newcastle, founded in 1919 by Paul Gallagher and Claire Turner. So we have a gallery in the city centre, where we host a number of exhibitions every year featuring both international and local artists. We exhibit paintings, prints, drawings, and small sculptural works, and we specialize in modern British art, Japanese woodblock prints, and work from mid-century France and America. Our framing workshop is in Berkeley, and we have framed for museums, universities, galleries, like the Hatton and the Lang. And for more information about Galerie or the exhibition, oh, yeah, take over the, the waiting room. Um, for more information about Gallagher and Turner or this exhibition, please visit our website where you can join our main. So now I'd just like to show you some images of Gavin's paintings. So just the um, screen sharing so you can get a So take um, some of these so you can have a look at the paintings. Now I'd just like to give a short introduction to uh, Gavin and the exhibition. Informed by the rich visual culture, of <laughs> Gavin Watson's paintings explore the relationships forged between humans and animals and the internal and external worlds they share. He uses humour as a way in for people and to make the work more accessible. The surreal imagery kind of makes you do a double take. And the funny titles make me think about the stories within the paintings. His painted scenes are quiet but dramatic, capturing the essence and emotion of the animals in them. This is Gavin's first time exhibiting at Gallagher and Turner. The exhibition title, Protect and Survive, references a booklet printed by the UK government in the 1970s, which was intended to inform citizens on how to protect themselves during a nuclear attack. The narratives within Gavin's work simply reference a myriad of sources from Tiger King to climate change to historical events and cultural traditions. The result is mildly surreal paintings which hint at a larger narrative beyond the dreamlike scenes they represent. They seek to portray our collective consciousness and a sense of belonging. Gavin keeps a postcard on his studio wall by artist Gillian Wearing. In it, a man holds a message which says, everything in life is connected. The point is to know it and to understand it. Born in Sunderland in 1962, Gavin Watson lives and works in, in rural Northumberland. He has exhibited his work at the Bose Museum, Sunderland Museum, Cricket Hill Gallery in New York, and has regularly been selected for the BP National Portrait Award. Last year, he was awarded the Visitor's Choice Award 
at the New Light Art Prize, and he's also been commissioned by the Duchess of Northumberland. He is currently represented in London by the Jonathan Cooper Park West Gallery, and his work is in private collections in North America, Europe, and the Middle East. So now I'd like to show you some photos of the exhibition. You can see a little bit behind us. So I'll just stand um, screen share again. Bear with me. There's Paul and Gavin in the workshop. In the front of the gallery. It's at Christmas time to see a few wreaths around and Christmas jumpers. <laughs> And I'd just like to show you one more image because we're about to watch and um, the video interview with Gavin that we filmed a few weeks ago, but in, in it, he mentions this painting called Waiting for Doggo. And it's really frustrating that you can't see it. So I thought I could just show you it before I play the interview. So this is the painting he's talking about. So I'll just play this interview now. You should be able to hear it as well. So just um, sit back and relax. Yeah, can you hear me now? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Right, well, thank you so much for doing this. Right. Um, I'll get, get into the first question. So, yeah. um, can you share your background and how you first got interested in art? Um, well, I think when I was a child, I was really good at drawing. Just, I loved drawing. My dad always drew, and it was just something I was always good at. I was the kid in the class who could draw, I think. There was other kids in the class who could draw, but I felt comfortable. I felt comfortable with pictures and really crap at words. So I didn't feel comfortable reading. I think I was slightly dyslexic, but I found pictures comforting and stories comforting. And I think when I got older, I realized that my brain was more um straightforward i found images straightforward and i found words a struggle mm -hmm. so i just naturally drifted towards art and kept there stayed in my lane as they say <laughs> so many creative people isn't it um you know i know, I know. i've just left or pictures make more sense yeah yeah, I think I didn't realise till I started teaching when I was 23. And I think I realised then that I learnt better through images. I liked pictures with stories in. Like I, I looked at images to, to see what was going on in the world. And I hadn't realised that. And it was like a penny dropping, which was dead exciting. And it was good as a teacher, because then you could look at the way different people learnt, because people learn in different ways. I think the brain operates in different ways. And then I started reading about that, and it, it made me a little bit more confident to be, because uh, you always, I think, in the 1960s and 70s, I think the kids who did art were, <laughs> were the ones who weren't academic. Um, and I was definitely in that bracket. I wasn't academic. But then I found, found as I got older, I started to read because of art and learn. And I became quite academic. I wouldn't say I am academic, but you know, I, I became more comfortable with it. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah, okay. That's great. Thanks. Um... What subject matter do you focus on in your work and why do you choose it? Right, I think for the last 10 years, the subject matter has been the relationship between humans and animals 
is like a core theme. Um, I try and use things in my life to build stories around and symbols in my life, like everyday things, and then try and build narratives around those things. It sort of broadens out from there. I'm starting to introduce in some of my new series of work, um, things like migration, uh, migration of animals, migration of humans. I'm sort of forming links, links between how animals and humans cooperate and live together and then building stories. It doesn't always work, but it's, it's a theme, I guess. If that makes sense. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, I definitely see some of those themes in your in your newer work. So, like the last child in the woods and yes. migration yeah. and the butterflies and, and humans as well. I think there's sort of layers. Uh, I quite like making an interesting image to start with. And then there's stories within that, like little things that people wouldn't know or I know or if like there'll be little, lots of little stories, like in the notes I've given you about that, there's little things that trigger me when I'm creating the painting. Because the paintings tend to take months to develop. Because sometimes I get stuck and I'll just put them to one side, work on another painting, and then I'll sort of think how to resolve something within a painting and it'll take us and then I'll go back to it and try and have another go and, and build a story or, or or just leave it for a while sometimes years I've got paintings here that I've left for years and that I will a, a good example is uh the pig the little pig scratch and sniff yeah that was it that was in the studio for six or seven years unresolved and then I just resolved it for the exhibition I don't know, I, I just woke up one morning and thought, oh, I'll just do that. I'll just make a joke. That's what I'll, do. I'll just have a bit of fun. Often it is, oh, I quite like to use humour as a, a, a wane sometimes. Um, and uh, as part of the story, I'll use humour to, to sort of, so people who are not used to looking at art, which is most of the people I know in life, mm -hmm. they're confused by art and they think, oh, like I don't understand. So a little bit of gentle humour often draws them in and they realise they can understand. Uh, and it's, there's no big secret. Um, it's, just, it's, just a, it's just a picture, really. That there leads me nicely into the next question. That is, what is the process of starting a painting like for you? Oh, well, I, I normally have around anything from six, seven to 10 to 15 paintings started at once. Oh my God, really? And I'll, yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll, some will float to the surface and some will get left and I'll rework later. Um, but I, I, I quite like the paintings to talk to each other. So an idea I might start in one painting might work and I'll have to re go into another painting to, to see if it works on that one. <laughs> and there's a lot of painting over and a lot of trial and error and, and doing something. I usually work on a painting for a week and then I'll work on another painting for a week and then another painting and I'll rotate them round. And as after I've got a month into a painting, some will come to the surface and get, get more near completion. And I might just try and complete that painting. Uh, others I might just leave. Um, I've got plenty of paintings I just leave. <laughs> uh, but I quite like them to have a theme and to feed off each other. And to have like conversations with each other. So the paintings all sort of be thematic um, and uh, depend on what I'm reading at the time, what's on the news, what, what just what, what music I'm listening to. It'll be, it's an eclectic sort of 
shambles, really. It's a, it's a brain shambles. And I write everything down in a sketch part, which is just scattered notes. Um, and I try and sort of assemble them in the paintings. I like the sound of what you're saying about the paintings speaking to each other. So if you're working on a few paintings at the same time, would they usually form part of the same series? Yes, yes, yes. I, I think I'll normally work on a series for three or four years. I think the one, the series I'm presently doing, which is about migration and um, global warming, amongst other things, I'll basically throw in anything that's on my mind. Um, I think, I think this will continue for quite a few years. I've got quite a few ideas and I want to expand out into all sorts of different things. So I'm expecting to work on this series for four, five, six, seven, ten, till I die. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> till the world ends. <laughs> Which is pretty close, I guess. <laughs> Happy thought. <laughs> um. Would you mind giving me a look at your studio space? Yeah, yeah, I've, I've basically turned paintings round. There's paintings here from years. So I've just made it look like there's lots of paintings here. And most, mostly when I'm working here, the paintings are turned round. So it looks quite cosy. I normally have a few paint, the paintings that I'm working on um, visible, but um, I'll, I'll I'll show you around. Um, I'll take you. Uh, there's. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is my desk. And there are my pits and my brushes and my solvents. And look okay? Yeah, that's great. Well, it's lovely to see a workspace. I love um, seeing people. Videos and... I have tidied it up so it looks, <laughs> so I don't look like an absolute total scumbag. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. I, I normally, I mean, I live in here, really. This is the biggest room. I live in a little cottage. This is the biggest room. And this is where I spend 99% of my time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> um, the next thing that I wanted to ask you is, what would you say is an integral part to the work of an artist? Right, um, I think communication. I think, um, well, I can only speak for myself, but I think you reflect back the world you see around you, the world you experience. And you. Tr I, I think an artist tries to order that and then represent it back. So you act as a filter. I think uh, an artist, fundamentally is a communicator, communicates the world they experience. So I see my job as just filtering, filtering all the rubbish out and trying to put together stories that matter, that matter to me, trying to find universal truths in, from my life um, and sort of represent them back. And it's quite hard. <laughs> Did that make any sense? Oh, you're like an artist and a painter and you're making these images, but you're also like um, investigating the topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I like to read. I like to know what's going on in the world. And I think uh, in the studio, I try and filter that and try and make sense of it, I guess making sense of the world, making sense of my world, uh, and where I, who I am in the world. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's communication as well. It's having the ability, because most people, I think everybody, unless you're a 
famous politician or something, you haven't got a voice in the world. I think as an artist, you sort of have got a voice, however small that is, or you think you've got a voice. <laughs> and, I th and I think it's trying to use that wisely um, and try and be who you are, Tr try and be authentic, I guess, maybe true to yourself. God, I'm getting heavy now. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, do you have a favourite work that you've made? Yes, I, I, when, hmm, yeah. I think the painting that I realised, the painting I did that I realised I was onto something was a painting called Waiting for Doggo. Well, you have to send me a picture. I'll send you a picture of Waiting for Doggo. It, um, it was basically a play on a Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, but it was a dog <laughs> with a halo. Um, and it was a whippet. And I, I was basically starting to use the symbolism of, of a northern person, like a whippet being a northern working class, called a working class horse really because people used to bet on whippet racing like uh like people down south bet on horses or people in ireland bet on horses like the whippet was the northeast horse or classed as the northeast horse and classed as a working class animal uh and now what i did in that painting was the first painting i placed an animal in place of a human and placed it in a human predicament or in, in an artistic context, I think. Uh, anyway, and I really liked that painting. It was like a, a click moment. It was the one where I thought, hmm, that, was a, that, that worked, or I felt it worked. So I think that was, I'll send you a picture of it. Oh yeah, that'd be great, thanks. Okay. And, um, can you share what you're working on at the moment or any other future plans? Yeah, I'm. These are the paintings I'm. I basically have on the go at the moment. Um, they're not completed. Can you see that? Yeah. And these are all incomplete and sort of started, um, and they're just being developed. Uh, they're part of the same series that's of some in the gallery. Um, and I have others. I've got some big ones, but they're in the other room. The, um, big seascapes. I'm, uh, I'm starting to put um, displace animals in boats and biospheres in boats, like trees in boats and gardens in boats. Um, Ghosts in bathtubs. Pardon? Ghosts in bathtubs, like the one in. <laughs> yeah, I quite like my, my dad went to sea. My dad was a uh, marine engineer, and all my family on his side went to sea. So I've got a sort of strong affinity with the sea because I probably should have gone to sea, but I didn't. I ended up doing this. Um, and I quite like, uh, one of my favourite paintings is, or one of my favourite painters as a child, is a painter called Clarkson Stanfield. He's a Sunderland painter. He was around when Turner was around and he painted seascapes. And when I was a child, I used to love the paintings in Sunderland Museum and Art Gallery. And they still have a big effect on me. Uh, beautiful paintings and I wanted to sort of play around with some of those images that initially influenced us when I was a child um, and just have a bit of fun with them so I'm using quite a lot of his compositions um, to sort of play with <laughs> anyway and, and some of them are just thoughts at the moment because um, I wanted uh, in some of the paintings I've got the sea coming into domestic settings, like uh, northern living rooms. And I wanted to go outside into the sea uh, and see what that was like, because I've never done it before. And I thought it would be interesting and good fun. So 
So I'm, I'm, yeah, that's what I'm doing there. Really. I know they have the same series as the ones in the gallery um, on the beach. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to sort of create Gav world, you know, where all there's a world like there's a seascape, there's a landscape, there's an interior, exterior. So I'm trying to develop my world, my world view, <laughs> world domination. <laughs> No, I, I, I always, I'm, in the past, I've always stuck to like interiors um, and I thought it's about time to get outside, what with COVID and all that, sick of being inside. <laughs> so just really play with something different, yeah. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, but thank you, Gavin, for doing that interview with me. And thank you for being so generous and showing um, works in progress in your studio and everything. It was really, really lovely to see. Um, yeah. Gavin, where are you? Do you want to come on and say hi now? Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Hello, everyone. Hi, um, Gavin. Oh, hello there. Um, is it time to ask questions? Does anybody want to ask me a question about what I'm doing? Like, why, why do I do this? <laughs> or any questions about the work you've seen? Or any comments? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I think you have to turn I've got your a comment. I'm pleased you didn't go to see. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that, Leanne? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I would never get all the fountains of knowledge. <laughs> uh, can I ask a question, Kevin? Hi, hello. Hello, hi. Uh, uh, I like your work. I, I particularly like the humours in your work. Um, it sounds, I suspect that quite a lot of people like the dogs uh, and the other animals. Um, and I wondered um, how much of the animals are anthropomorphic, you know, showing human emotions and I'm thinking about that last child in the woods picture that you've got what's that all about um how is that different because it does seem to be very different from all the animals that are producing you've got a human in the in the scene why that um well I, a couple of years ago I went to Morelia in Mexico and I went to see the migration of the monarch butterflies and basically it was a the, that was the one pin as a result of that trip to Mexico. I basically uh, went up to see the migration and there's, you may have seen it on the telly, there's billions of butterflies. It's quite a moving thing. And they, they arrive when, uh, at the time of the Day of the Dead. So they're clustered as spirits of the past. So I wanted to do, and I was also reading a book about, um, about how children are brought up now without any sort of experience of being outside. They're, they're all on computers. Um, so it was, it was basically uh, a singular painting um, just about my experience in Mexico, really. And I wanted to sort of make a comment. Uh, I also read a, a fact about while I was in Mexico, there was a, a, a mummified body found of a child and it was the oldest uh, body of a child found in the Americas. Um, and just the, ch the title Last Child in the Woods seemed to be a good sort of title for the age we live in, I guess. Does that make any sense to you? Uh, I, I like that answer. I think that's a good answer, Gavin. Uh, do, do you think that, do you think you intentionally tend to display human emotions in the animals. Um, I can do. I, sometimes I use them as props. I use animals. It just depends. It depends. Every painting's different. I, I, I can... What I like to do is take two disparate things and try and gel them together sometimes to get a third thing that's bigger than the two things that I jam together. Um, to get a, a talk. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But um, 
I like layers. Sometimes you can look at a painting and say, all right, I know what it is. It's a, it's a girl running through a forest. There's butterflies and birds and what have you, all, all them things. But then the title might lead you in a different direction. And then there's an understory of what, what influenced us and all the things like that. So, so you, I, I like it that people can take things at different levels, that they don't have to know all this stuff. They could just have a win via humour or via they just like the painting or they like the colours or, 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 or they can paint their own stories or, or develop their own stories about uh, what they see. I mean, that's the whole thing about art, really. It's like, I, I think most artists don't really know what they're doing. And I think I'm in that category. <laughs> you look as if I know what I'm doing. But 99% of the time, I haven't got a clue. I'm just <laughs> trying my hardest to... Yeah. Um, and what, matter, what matters is uh, what the viewer brings to it and makes of it, actually. That you, you do it, but uh, we read stuff into it, which is why I like that, uh, that uh, girl in the, with the, the butterflies. I'm not going to hog this. I'll, I'll just say thank you very much for your, oh, thank you. uh, your answers. I, I like your work. Nice to meet you. Thank you. There's another um, question in the chat from Annie. Um, so it says, hi, Gavin. How much of your childhood and experiences in Sunderland do you think has informed or influenced your adult quest for answers and representation, if any? Thanks, Annie. I, I, think, I think quite a lot. I, I think, uh, I mean, I'm still very friendly with a lot of people from my childhood in Sunderland. Some of my best friends uh, are from school. I still see them. Um, and I think the humour and sort of self-deprecation um, informs me paintings a lot because I, I, I try not to treat art as a heavy subject because I think art can be alienating and I think if I've got any job in life it's to make art universal or make the people I know like art. Um, yeah. that it? Um, we've got another question from Cameron. Hi Cameron. Hey Gavin, good to see you again. Hi. Um, Hi. So um, yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Um, I, I'm not sure if my mom has told you, but I'm working I'm in producing animated uh, TV shows. So I'm working with artists all the time and it's really helpful to be able to learn more about the process and what's going on in your head. Um, and, and so my question is when I was a kid, um, uh, I grew up with a lot of Gavin's paintings around my house. And I remember they always were so large and, and haunting and beautiful with the colors you use. And I'm curious if there were, was any sort of inciting incident or things in, in your personal life that um, made you, and I'm sorry if you already touched on this, I joined about 15 minutes late, but made you decide to transition into, into translating that to animals. Um, Cause you know, there's obviously a more jovial aspect to it, um, but you still bring that same beauty and, and not necessarily hauntingness with, with animals less haunting, but you bring that same beauty and a lot of the same style, stylistic choices to the animals. And I'm curious what motivated you to, to make that switch. I think it was just broadening things out. I think like yourself, I've always had animals around me and I live in the country. Um, and I just, some of my best friends have been animals. <laughs> And I think the characters in animals, I, I don't think I'm un, unusual in that, but I, I, I have a bond with animals. And I think you can, I, I just think they're good subject matter. I, it's like everything I like to broaden out. I think when I was younger, I sort of stuck to rigid ways of doing things. Um, and I think as I've got older and a bit more confident and a bit less bothered, I just, I basically introduce all sorts of things into the work. Um, if I live till about 150, I'd like to just paint everything, you know, everything at least once. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's a really great answer. Good to see you, Cameron, anyway. You too. You too. Happy to be here. Thanks see so much, Gavin. Bye-bye. Just having a look in the chat to see if there are any other questions. Someone's asked, can we watch the video offline? And yes, this has been recorded, so it will be um, available to watch again. 
and the interview is on YouTube as well. If you want to um, revisit that, you can watch that back again. And of course, I've just linked um, the exhibition page on our website. So Gavin did a really nice blog post on there where he kind of um, went into a bit more depth in each painting and gave a bit of backstory, uh, which is really lovely. Um, oh, Rosie from Bose Museum said, Waiting for Duggar is my favorite. <laughs> it was actually shown at uh, Bose Museum a few years ago. So thanks, Rosie. Hi, Rosie. And no other questions in the chat. So did I ask a question? Go ahead, go ahead. Is that okay. Hello, Gal. Hi, Julia. Hello, everyone. I I just wanted to say thanks, and I'm really sorry for coming in late. There, I've really really tried my hardest, and I'm very tech, not very good. So yeah, sorry not about like that. Not like you, one. Julia, to turn up late. <laughs> Gav was my tutor. It's so embarrassing. Nothing's changed. Um. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, that was a really, really inspiring talk and, and um, one of the things I was thinking about and you having taught me and a few others on here I can see as well, um, and you taught us a lot about other artists that influenced you and how much your time in Italy influenced you and, and I was wondering, and I'm perhaps wrong, but if there was another artist from another era, Gav, that you could travel back in time and be and there's maybe a painting or a brush stroke that you really you admire what what painting it would be in which artist and that was my question uh, good question i'd i'd be caravaggio because i thought you might be <laughs> <laughs> and uh i'd be caravaggio and i'd have murdered a man and i'd be a white rogue and an alcoholic and uh i'd be dead on a beach um yeah. <laughs> and if you were an animal gav which animal would you would you identify with the most? I'd be a collie, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very yeah, good. I think there's one painting, I forget the name of it. It's a Caravaggio painting in Santa Maria del Popolo. And it's a really dynamic composition. I always forget the name of it. But it's my favourite painting because when I first went to school, it was the first church I went in. It was one of the first paintings I saw, and it blew me away. I didn't know it was Caravaggio. Uh, and later, I went back. I was staying at the British School at Rome. I went into their library, and I looked it up, and I found out it was Caravaggio. I'd never heard of him before. Um, and just thought, wow, that's great. And then I looked up all the Caravaggios in Rome, and he wasn't that popular then. And by the time I came back, got on with life, films were being made about Caravaggio, like art historians were reassessing. And now he's a fantastic uh, historical artist and people know a lot more about him. So it was a lot of discovery for me. Um, and I think that'll, that stayed with me. So yeah, I'm always influenced by all sorts of things, but I think Caravaggio's had the biggest influence on us. Not on the way I paint, but just on uh, being independent uh, in my artistic view, I guess. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Gav. You. Thanks, Julia. Nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> A message from Rebecca in the chat to say, Waiting for Doggo was purchased from the New Light Prize Exhibition by New Light's patron, Valerius Sites. That's right, Sykes. Sykes, yeah. And now is proudly displayed at Grantley Hall near Ripon. It is very much loved and it will soon be joined by Future Island mm. from the current New Light Prize exhibition. Oh, well done, Gavin. That's love. <laughs> and we've got a question from Michael and he asked, are there any religious impressions coming through in your work, particularly in your use of window and lamp lights? Um. Yes, I always sort of play with light as a metaphor for God in a really playful way. I, I, when I stayed in Italy, um, I always read that light was an expression of God. So I'm not religious myself, but I like using the metaphors and I like using the symbolism just as a tool to play with and as a, a, a means of like a vocabulary. So it's an it's intrinsic part of me vocabulary. So yes, I, I always, um, 
I like using the lamps as like the standing lamps as like a traditional, like with the ducks as like traditional working class symbolism. Like when I was young, my mom and dad have still got a standing lamp in their living room and uh, it's, it appears in quite a lot of my paintings. Um, but I use it in a playful way as a representation of God a god that I don't believe in, <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> oh God, you're not sure you believe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I don't know, I hope I haven't upset anybody there about gods, but- it, it... upset Tom, huh? <laughs> Oh, is Tom all there, Sharon? No, but you would upset him. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Julia. Hello, Julia. Hi, hi. Hello. <laughs> after investing so much love and time and talent in a painting, when you come to sell it, how easy is it to let it go and just it's send fine. it on? <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Um, I quite like them to have good homes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, I think uh, it's really interesting the people who buy the work or want to buy the work. Yeah. Um, I mean, you own one of my paintings. I am very sad, them. aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's it's always good to have, I just love seeing my paintings and go all around the world. I, mm -hmm. I, I think it's great. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy to do that. And of course, now with digital images, the digital yeah. images can sort of go out into the world as well. So. No, I'm quite happy. I, I'm always on to the next thing. I always like... So, Gavin, if I can ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Gavin, can, yeah. I, can I ask a question? Yeah. So, so, if, so, <laughs> so if somebody came along, say, to the gallery or, or, or whatever, and you really didn't take to them, would you still be happy to sell them one of your paintings that's very personal to you? Um, well, I wouldn't Has that ever happened? Uh, there has been one case um, where I had a really disturbing talk in a London gallery with someone who was interested in a painting. They, in the event, they didn't end up buying a painting. But um, no, I, that very rarely happens, Claire. Mm. Uh, I'm pretty lucky that most people who like my work are nice people. <laughs> I wonder why that is. <laughs> I think it's just luck. <laughs> no, I, th I think by and large, if people want to invest their time, because it's quite an unusual thing to own a painting, because um, it's sort of constructed over a period of time and it's, it's a group of thoughts. It, it, it's weird. It's like an encapsulation of a, of a period of time. Um, it's like a little time capsule on the wall of, an, of a series of ideas. So it is quite an unusual thing. But um, no, I'm always, I'm always interested to see who buys my work and who wants to buy my work. And I've been quite lucky that most people who've bought my work are brilliant and I love them to bits. <laughs> well, including my sister. <laughs> yeah, Gavin, just another qu question, if I may. How, what, what's the quickest you've painted something, and what's the? Sorry, you froze. I'm always freezing. All right. So, can, can can you do some paintings quite quickly? I could, but it wouldn't be my. I could, but it wouldn't be my style. It mm -hmm. takes years to develop. I didn't want to paint like a paint, like a given painter. I wanted, I wanted my paintings to look like what I wanted them to look like to represent me. So everybody would look at the paintings and go, "Oh, that's a Gavin," not like, "Oh, it looks like Joe Bloggs," or it looks like. Ronnie Smith or Bertie this or <laughs> basically <laughs> I'd like them to be idiosyncratic to me and unique to me. 
I know that's a, a, a vain hope, but I, I think the older I get, the more me the paintings become, the more representative of me they become. Um, and speed is not my thing. <laughs> how, gonna... how long? How long could a painting take you? Oh, the the longest of a painting's taken is the in the gallery. It's the one called Last Child in the Woods. It's not a mm -hmm. big painting; it's quite small. But it took me about five months, um, mm -hmm. and that's from start to finish. Um, it was just, but, but it's highly detailed. It's like pain painstakingly detailed um, and I don't really work from photographs or anything so it was it's all like constructed so there was a lot of mistakes I spend a lot of time correcting mistakes and um, I think if uh, Nan's still watching she'll always say that I need the painting taken away from me <laughs> you, need to, you need to be told that you are finished <laughs> yes. Thank you, Nan. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know when to stop? He doesn't. Um, <laughs> stop it, Nan. <laughs> um, no, uh, it comes to a natural end. It, there's just, I've resolved all the problems. There's no, if I look at a painting and I see mistakes, then I keep working at it. So it, it basically a bit it builds up um, in layers, layers upon layers upon layers. Gavin, does your narrative ever change with a painting? You know, so, like when you start. Sorry, does your narrative ever change within a painting? You know, when you start, you start out with a painting. Do you feel like your narrative ever shifts? Is that why they get put down for a little while? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Often, yeah. often I get lost. I lose me where I always do that. Um, most of the problems I have with painting is, re is resolving them because they get, I have an idea, I paint it and it doesn't work. That happens yeah. all the time. Uh, it's, it's basic and then I've got to uh, resolve it, put it to one side, think it through. That's why I like to have um, 10 or 15 on the go at once because then they, I can try an idea on one and if it doesn't work, I'll move on to the next one. Or I might say, oh, wait, it might work on that one instead of the one I've failed with. Um, yeah. I, it's, it's quite laborious and boring, really. I've got a really boring job, but the result <laughs> is often quite nice. But the, <laughs> the, the, the sort of hours and Definitely weeks... Definitely not boring. <laughs> well, it, 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 the process is. The process yeah. is quite uh, torturous, really. And it, yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. But it's the only way I can work effectively, um, or it's the only way I can think. I, yeah, can I ask a question um, from James that's been put in the chat? Yes, um, yeah. It's about process again. He mm -hmm. asked, what is a working day like in terms of actual painting? And he said for him it's bursts of activity, not nine to five, but kind of evenings or little bits here and there. And he also asked, do you ever start one, scrap it and then paint over the top? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I, some, I, I don't tend to much now scrap it all together. I, I very rarely scrap a paint and I'll just leave it if I get lost. My daily work is pretty dull. I just get up. I'm usually in between eight or nine. Uh, I work till two. No, I work till two to two thirty. Then I have an hour off. Um, I'll have something to eat. Um, go for a run, bike ride, a little bit of exercise, something. Then I get back in for five to six and work through till 10. And I normally do that six days a week. Um, I've started to do five days a week during COVID because the weeks go by too quickly. But I, I like a routine like that. Um, it it's just suits us. It's, it's something I've developed over the years. Um, and it's the easiest way for us. If I work in, say, six hour blocks, I can set myself a target to complete something in the six hours. And if it fails, then I'll start something else. I'll not stay another six hours at it. So I like to work in five, six hour blocks. If I can get two of them in during any day, 
that's usually good. On a Sunday, sometimes I'll just work for six hours or five hours. Um, I've started to take Saturdays off now uh, just to have a life. Who wants to be in the nature? <laughs> Um, another question from Louise, and she said, do you do a lot of drawing before painting or work mostly within the painting? Um, hi Louise, um, uh, no, I just go straight on. Um, I, I don't like to build up, I don't like, I like the surface of a painting to have a bit of life to it and to get the life in the painting. I need to build up layers and mistakes. Um, I don't like a thin painting. I, I like I like a bit of depth and a bit of a bit of um, a bit of failure. It's I, twenty I, I like hours. I failed and then resolved it. Uh, so I just draw straight on. Uh, sometimes I get references from random photographs or things like that but predominantly I always get to a stage and then I just work out my head. I work about I would say 70% out my head and then if I need a reference for say an animal or something like that I'll I'll get some references and then sort of build around that but I'll always spend the last oh, month or so on a painting uh, that's just out my head, just work out my head. Um, yes. um, another question from Michael, who said, do you Michael. paint oils and do you have insulation in your cottage? Um, uh, yeah, I work in oils and I do have insulation. No, ventilation. <laughs> ventilation, <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> not really. It's cold. I, I don't know where Michael's from, but it's bloody freezing here. Uh, <laughs> I think I've got enough ventilation. Um, no, it's. Um, I, I mean, uh, the studio is quite big and it's got tall, like the ceiling's about 12 feet high. So I've got, uh, I don't need that much ventilation. I work with uh, balsams. So they're nice smelling, they're like larch from a larch tree so it smells really nice in here and it's not sort of acidic or anything like that it's not bad for my health um and i work with oils good quality oils so um yeah so yeah it's good and healthy <laughs> and a question from cameron who said are there any pieces that you would never agree to part with um no no no, I'd, 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 I think uh, I, as a professional artist, you have to be prepared to sell your work. Um, and I, I don't, I'm starting to give away everything <laughs> I own. So I don't, I don't really want to hang on to stuff. There's no point, you know, I'd, I'd rather people have them enjoy, and enjoy them. I like, uh, I think my life is about painting. So I just, enjoy the process of painting and developing stuff and plus it's something to leave behind something good and one more question from james i think we'll have this as the last question unless anyone's got anything absolutely burning um because you know zoom fatigue and everything so he said sorry if i may have missed it earlier but do you have a home studio is it within the house or a separate building i'm just about to get a garden studio so just interesting um, James, yes, he's got a studio in his cottage. Yes, yes, it's the main room in my cottage. Um, I'm really envious of a garden studio because I'd love that. That's the dream. I'd love to have doors out onto the garden. That would be really good. No, I rent a small cottage in Northumberland in a little village, um, about 20 houses, 20 miles north of Newcastle. Um, it's a lovely little village. Um, and uh, yeah, just live quite humbly. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. I'm sorry if you've got any questions, you can email me or whatever. And we are <laughs> reading, um the exhibition on the 13th of April. So if you'd like to come and see it in person, um, please come.
Please come back. And I'm happy to come down the gallery if anybody wants to come into the gallery. I'm happy to talk anybody through anything if they want. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants to come? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Anything? Any more questions? Thank you for everybody coming. Lovely to see you all. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks, Gav. Thank you. Well. Thank, Thank you. you. Nice to see you. Take care, everyone.